Aquarius, Adam Kowarski here. Good morning. I uh, hope everyone's had a great evening. We're back here again with our breakfast by the bay. Uh, reminder, we're here at Save the Bay's Exploration Center and Aquarium. Uh, and at Save the Bay, another reminder here, uh, we work to protect and improve Narragansett Bay, right? Uh, and we do that through a few different ways. Our policy work, our habitat restoration work, and our education work. I am part of the education department. Uh, our real goal here is to get you to hopefully know a little bit more about Narragansett Bay, and then probably care a little bit more after that too. That's really our goal. So hopefully by the end of our class today, you're gonna feel that way a little bit too. Hopefully care a little more, maybe change some of your actions to help the bay as well. Um, so today, we are gonna be focusing on a certain category of animals called ba -ba -ba -ba, crustaceans, all right? So crustaceans are just a really interesting animal. Um, they're, they're pretty mysterious and they're just so different from people that I feel like it's just a wonderful thing uh, to talk about. Um, and for anyone who is just joining us now, again, my name is Adam Kowarski, Save the Bay's Aquarist here, and we're learning about crustaceans today. Um, so the first thing I'd like to do is just go over a few different things that are the characteristics of crustaceans, things that make a crustacean a crustacean. So first thing I'd like to, like to talk about uh, all crustaceans have a hard exoskeleton. Um, and I want to make pe sure people know, this isn't a shell like a clam has, it's an exoskeleton. I actually have a couple examples here. <coughs> so this is a shell from a big old clam called a surf clam, largest clam uh, species on the east coast here. And you can see they have this hard calcium carbonate based shell. Uh, and they live inside the shell, they can kind of open and close, and they have soft, fleshy parts that can be exposed sometimes. Okay, and then this is actually a molt from a crab called a blue crab. It's probably the most aggressive crab in the bay. They're, they're really interesting. A lot of them in Maryland. Uh, actually, as our bay gets warmer, we're seeing more and more of these guys as well. But you can see this is a molt, all right? Uh, and I'm gonna describe what molting is a little bit. So as a crab grows, uh, it starts off microscopic. It hatches out of an egg. It's microscopic. It floats around in the water column as plankton. As it grows, it gets bigger, and it gets too big inside of its shell, and it sheds its old shell. And every time it does that, it gets 25% bigger. And it comes out all soft and squishy, and then it hardens up over the next few days to have that nice protective exoskeleton here. All right? So they have a hard exoskeleton, not a shell. Some more features that make a crustacean a crustacean. They all have jointed appendages. And if we take a look at my wonderful drawing here, I'm not an artist, but I tried really hard today, you can see. Um, but if we take a look, you can see uh, they have appendages, all right? So different legs and arms and claws, things like that. Uh, and they have just joints on them so they can be flexible and move around, kind of like we have joints in our bones, uh, except for they have joints in their exoskeleton, which is kind of like bones on the outside. Um, all right, most crustaceans are generally aquatic. Most of them live in either fresh water or salt water situations. There's a, always a couple exceptions to the rule, but for the most part, that's what we have going on. So, you know, crab, shrimp, lobsters, stuff like that. They also have mandibles. So a couple appendages on their face that kind of act like their jaws and brings the food into their mouth and grinds it up and crushes it up. Um, really cool. I kind of wish I had mandibles sometimes, depending on what I'm eating. Um, and then they're also invertebrates. Uh, and we talked about invertebrates a few days ago, but as a reminder, an invertebrate is anything that does not have a backbone. If you don't remember what the backbone is, take a couple fingers, feel on the back of your neck, that hard bump, that's your backbone. All invertebrates do not have that backbone. All right, excellent. So I think we're ready to meet some live animals. You guys ready? Let's do this. So Adam, we already have a couple questions coming in, um, sure. so I'm going to ask you some of them. Um, Lexi and Maddox want to know, what is the normal color for a crab? I know you mentioned the blue crab, so are there any other colors? It's so interesting. Um, a lot of crabs will have different colors in their name, right? So some crabs are called the purple marsh crab, a European green crab, a blue crab. You get all these different names, and a lot of times when you're looking at colors in nature with the names that people give these crabs is very interpretive, but it's a good way to kind of help identify them. Even though sometimes I find green crabs and they're orange, or I find purple crabs and they're black, or if 
try and blue crabs, well, they're almost always pretty blue. Those ones work pretty good. <laughs> but then even the next crab I'm about to introduce here can have a lot of color variation. And we're going to talk about why. Good question, guys. Beautiful. And now, while we're looking at this tank, Juliet wants to know how many crabs do we have in here? Wow. So in this tank, I'd estimate we have probably about 20 to 30 different crabs in here right now, um, as far as the spider, spider crabs go. Uh, we also have hermit crabs, long clawed, broad clawed hermit crabs, and every once in a while, these little invasive Asian shore crabs sneak into this tank as well, uh, which you're actually going to be learning about later today if you watch some of our videos later. Um, but I'd really love to start talking about our common spider crab. All right, guys? So I'm going to go in. I'm going to pull one out here for us to check out. All right. Let's see. Let's, ooh, let's get this one. All right. So this right here is a common spider crab. This is a really interesting crustacean. And there's a lot of really cool things about them. One interesting thing about crabs, if you hold them just in your hands like that, they're never going to pinch your hands because they think your hands are the ground and they're just never gonna pinch the ground. So that's an interesting way to kind of hold them. Um, and just like the animals that we talked about yesterday, spider crabs can last out of the water for up to about six hours. Uh, a lot of times, uh, these guys will get stranded in tide pools or on the shoreline and really need to hang out for a while. So the first thing I think we're taking a look at here, Jess, can you see the mandibles? Absolutely, Adam. Yeah, so we're taking a look at the mandibles. Those are those really fun appendages that I wish I had that you can see right there. Um, they're moving them back and forth. They use that to help grind and crush their food. They don't have any teeth like us, no teeth. Just such a weird different animal. Um, and they use this, these mandibles to eat their food. Uh, these guys are what we classify as a scavenger. If people don't know what a scavenger is, a scavenger is something that walks along uh, their habitat or flies or whatever they do in life, but these guys, they walk along the bottom of the bay uh, looking for dead and decomposing plant and animal matter, and they eat it. Kind of like the garbage men of the bay. How important are these guys? We wouldn't want a bunch of dead fish uh, hanging out. These guys clean up, uh, which is just such a vital role that these guys play. Um, now one thing you can see too when I hold him, these legs here, they're kind of pointy. And look at that, he is really good at hanging on to me too. He's grabbing on. These guys live along rocky shores, which there's a lot of waves, a lot of wave energy, and they use those legs. Whew. <laughs> He's a wily one. I'm going to put him back in here so he can get back in. But they use those legs to hang on to the sides of the rocky shore so they don't get washed away in the waves. And you can kind of see them doing that in the crevices. Even the one down here, you can see, he's really hanging on tightly there. Now, one thing you might notice, some of our spider crabs have different colorations going on here, right? Some of them are darker, some of them are lighter. Oh, the dark ones are really hard for me to find. They're camouflaging. Yeah, so some are really dark, some are really light, different colors there. Now, all spider crabs, their shells are actually completely white. You're looking at this one and saying, well, that one looks kind of brown to me. What these guys do is they're also known as decorator crabs. So what they do, they'll walk around along the bottom of the bay, they'll pick up something interesting like a rock, a piece of seaweed, something like that, and then spit right on it. Their spit is super sticky uh, and kind of like cement. They pick it up, spit on it, stick it on their back. Sometimes when I pull these guys out of the bay, they'll have like a three foot long piece of seaweed on it, um, anemones, urchins, different things like that, uh, which I think is just so interesting. Uh, and you know, sometimes people think they do that to decorate and look pretty, but it's not just to look pretty. It's actually so these guys can camouflage, so they can hide from predators, so uh, they don't get eaten by different things. There's a lot of things that look, would like to eat a spider crab. It's got a lot of uh, energy that can be transferred to different animals. Such a cool animal. All right, I'm ready to show you some more things about spider crabs too. So Adam, while you're getting some more spider crabs today, yeah. um, we do have a couple questions if you're ready to answer them. Sure, let's do it. Uh, Rachel asks, are there crustaceans that are not aquatic? You know what, there definitely are a couple, and the name of them is kind of, uh, I'm blanking on the names of them. If anyone wants to do an internet search and try and find some and maybe post it while we're talking here and let, and let me know in a little bit, I'd love to find out myself too. Otherwise, we'll look it up later and, and we'll post that. That's a great question. 
Beautiful. And then we have two questions um, from Maddox and Lexi. Um, so the first one, I know you picked up that spider crab that was moving around a little bit. Yeah. Um, they want to know, are crabs normally crabby? Ah, crabs are just about always crabby. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and then their second question is, how deep do these crabs usually hang out? You know, it, it really depends. So for spider crabs, they can be anywhere from just right at the shore, even on the shore sometimes, and they can be up to a couple hundred feet uh, a really interesting spider crab, the largest spider crab on the world, uh, the Japanese spider crab. They can actually be 12 feet long from claw to claw. 12 feet. That is huge. These guys live in the depths of the ocean, in the deepest parts of the ocean, and their primary food source is actually dead whales. That's mostly what they eat. Uh, these are just, those are amazing animals. They're related to these guys. They look just like this, but let me tell you, 12 feet from claw to claw. Beautiful. And one last question for you. Sure. Um, so Matthew wants to know, do they only use their claws to pick up food or do they pinch predators with those claws? Oh yeah, they absolutely will use them for defense. Um, you can see their claws, they're not that intense. They're not that big on a spider crab. Their primary defense is going to be camouflage, right? So blending in, decorating their shell, that sort of thing is really what's going to help these guys protect themselves. But they definitely use the claws to kind of push stuff away. Uh, it would have to be a pretty small predator for them to be able to get them away, actually. But yeah, they will use them. Good question, Matthew. All right, excellent. Ready to move on here, guys? Let's do it. So if we take a look at this spider crab, I'm going to teach you guys how to tell the difference between a male and a female. So this one here is actually a female. If you take a look at its at the belly here, it's not actually a belly, it's called a telson, it's a modified tail. So evolutionarily, kind of like a lobster, the tail used to kind of stick out down here. And then over time, over eons, it's wrapped up over and is now underneath and protects their soft underside. Um, and for a female spider crab, they use their telson to hold eggs. Now you can see this telson here, it's very round, it has the stripes on it, and I think it kind of looks like a basketball. That's a good way to kind of tell the female here. Now one thing I just noticed, this spider crab uh, is what we call a sponge crab. So they actually have a whole bunch of eggs in here. I don't know if you guys can see that, but there's th up to 3,000 eggs in there. I'm gonna put those back. So she is full of eggs. And eventually those will all hatch out in the, into the water column, they'll, they'll disperse, and they'll be planktonic, which I think is really amazing. Uh, they call that a sponge crab too, because it kind of looks orange and spongy like a sponge. All right. I'm going to start looking at all our crabs here. I'm going to see if I can find a male so I can show you guys the difference. Let's take a look and we'll start checking and see what we can find. Beautiful. So while you're doing that, uh, we do have a question from Terry here. She yeah. wants to know if there's such thing as pink crabs. Um, you know, I'm not sure. Here's the deal. I'm an expert on the life that lives in Narragansett Bay. Once you start leaving the bay, I start to know less and less about the variety that's out there. Um, but there very well might be pink crabs. Now there is a crab in the bay called a lady crab, um, and they can have a very pinkish hue. Uh, there's also another crab called a rock crab. Sometimes they look really pink to me as well. Good question. All right, excellent. So let's take a look at this one. I have found us a male to check out. Um, so if you look at the Telson area of the male, it's pretty darn different, I think. Um, you can see it's not puffed out like the females there, and it isn't really big and round. Uh, it, kind of, I think it looks more like a lighthouse sort of shape there. Um, Got to kind of use your imagination on that, but I think it looks a lot like a lighthouse. So that's a really good way to tell a male and a female spider crab. This uh, way to tell the difference between males and females works pretty well for most crab species. Some, some of them get to be harder to tell, uh, but these guys work really well for this. Excellent. All right, guys, so I think we're ready to meet another crab. All right, so we're actually gonna walk through a construction zone here. Why don't you guys follow me while you get a sneak peek. All right, right this way. <laughs> so this room right here is under construction. Uh, we're actually building our shark and skate aquaculture exhibit. What aquaculture is, is growing and breeding different types of fish and things that live in the water. Uh, so for us, 
We're going to be growing and breeding sharks and skates and releasing them back out into the bay. We already do a lot of this, but this is going to help us do more of it and, and really have a cool exhibit for people. So if you keep checking in with our live uh, streams here, we're eventually going to do a nice presentation on that too. All right, right this way, guys. All right, excellent, welcome. So we are gonna take a look at another species here, all right? So this crab is a little different. Uh, this is a European green crab. So I'm gonna grab one of these guys out here for us to start learning about. So Adam, Janine had a question on how do you properly hold these crabs? Good question, Janine. So uh, all crabs, are, their shells are a little different, so holding them in a way where you're not gonna get pinched can be a little different. So for the green crab, you can see I have all of my fingers on top. I'm holding it just like I'd be holding maybe a ball, something like that. They can't really reach their back too well, so this works pretty good for them. Um, so, European green crabs, what do you guys think? Are they from America? No, they're not from America. These guys are actually from Europe. Uh, but, I don't know if you remember, every single animal in the whole aquarium was found in Rhode Island waters. All right, but these guys are from Europe. We found them in Rhode Island. So what that means, these guys are an invasive species. So they were brought to Rhode Island maybe 150, 200 years ago with European colonists traveling here to colonize uh, Rhode Island. When they came here, they came on boats, and in Europe, uh, when they started traveling, they had to ballast their boats. So what they actually used to do was take big pieces of salt marsh uh, and a bunch of soil there called peat, stick it in the bottom of those boats, and then they would take that journey all the way to Rhode Island. When they get here, they would remove that soil and that those grasses, that peat, and they would dump it off here in Rhode Island. There would be all kinds of hitchhikers that would come with them, uh, and the European green crab is one of them. So they were transported by people to Rhode Island and now they're actually uh, what we classify as invasive. These guys take over the habitats of the crabs that are already here and they outcompete them for resources. They're really aggressive. They reproduce at a higher rate. They produce more eggs every year than like our spider crab does. Uh, they eat the food quicker. They're active earlier in the season and later into the season as well. And they're more adaptable. They can live in multiple habitats in many different conditions, all right? Uh, now, you might not know if you have a green crab or not, so I think the next thing I'd like to do is show you how to identify one. So, Jess, why don't you zoom in on this crab here, right on his back here, on the carapace. Actually, let me get a little more light here so you can really see him. How's that look? Beautiful. Great. So, if we look at the eye socket here, you can see his little antenna appendage. They usually, there's two of them. Uh, and you look at the eye socket, and you look to the right of it, there's these spikes here. Uh, and if we count them, there are one spike, two spike, three spike, four spike, five spike. And for me, a good way to remember, a good trick to remember, that spells out the word green. You ready? G-R-E-E-N. So that's a, just the best way you can tell that you have a green crab here. All right, that's the easiest way to do it. Now, invasive species is a common problem worldwide. Now that we have such a interconnected global economy and global world with travel, all these different things going on, it's really easy to spread animals to parts of the world where they're not supposed to be. Best thing to do with wildlife, always do your best just to leave it where it's from. Don't transport it to other places because it can make this kind of stuff happen. Uh, the nice thing that you can do to help with this is you can educate other people about it, remind them to leave wildlife where it's from, uh, and then there's even sometimes programs to remove invasive wildlife from the wild to help give the poor little native crabs a shot at survival and not having to compete as much with these guys. All right, even though these guys are invasive, I still think they're really cool and I think they're beautiful and a wonderful crab, so we're gonna take really good care of the ones that we have here. Beautiful, Adam, and we do have a question from Lila. Um, she wants to know, because we've been taking these crabs in and out of the water, she wants to know if the crabs can breathe in and out of water. Yeah, so these species of crabs can absorb a little bit of oxygen through their gills when they're out of the water, as long as they're still very moist. So while these crabs are out of the water, they're still able to absorb some oxygen. That being said, both of these species of crabs can last out of the water a good six hours without any problems in proper conditions. For us, 
we're taking them out just for a minute or two, putting them back in, and you can see this guy's running around already, causing havoc with all his buddies, uh, and, and totally happy and healthy. Great question, that's something I'm always concerned with as well. Beautiful, and then we have a couple questions surrounding those eggs that we saw in our spider crab. Yeah. Um, so some people out there wanna know if the tank will just ever fill up completely with crabs, and if all the babies will survive. Yeah. So that's a great question. With those thousands of eggs that hatch out, they actually act primarily in the wild as food for other animals. They're at the base of the food web, it's plankton that feeds all kinds of other juvenile fish. So in the wild, very few of them survive. Um, you know, a, a fraction of a percent make it to adulthood. Uh, in our tanks, what we do, we do end up having a lot of crabs in there sometimes, so what we do a lot of times, we take our crabs uh, that are pregnant, like the one you saw, and we release them back out into the wild. We try not to keep any animals here for longer than about a year on average is, is usually our goal. Um, so they can be out in the wild, reproducing, adding to the populations of Narragansett Bay. Great question. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. We have a couple questions coming in about why our green crabs don't look so green. That, so that's what I was trying to say earlier, right? So look at these guys. Why do they call, you know, I don't know why they call them a green crab. If you really use your imagination and sort of stare at them, they look a little bit green to me, but not a lot bit green. <laughs> Almost more orange, right? Good question. Beautiful, and I think that's about all the questions we have. We did get an answer to our um, land-based crustacean question, if you want to know. Oh, absolutely. Um, so Nancy said that there's terrestrial crabs, um, terrestrial hermit crabs, and wood lice. Wow, oh, wood lice. I don't even know what that is. I, I need to look that up. That sounds super interesting. Um, well, thank you so much, Nancy, for looking that up. I hope everyone had a good time enjoying what we had going on today. And if you have more questions, you can always email us or, or check us out on Facebook. Uh, one thing I want to let you guys know, uh, we have different activities that have to do with crustaceans. And if you look below this live stream, there's going to be some links that you guys can click on for these different activities, including our Molting Madness one, which is a really fun one uh, that you guys definitely have to check out. Um, if you guys enjoyed this and you like Save the Bay, you like the work we're doing and you want to support us, uh, there's also another link at the bottom of this page where you guys can actually donate to Save the Bay, become members, any of that kind of stuff, find ways to get involved. Um, and, you know, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, so thank you all so much and have a great day. Adam Kowarski signing off.